How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Friday here on this program, and you know what that means. We got a lot of news to talk about here today, and by the grace of the good Lord, none of it is about Sasha and Naomi. No update today whatsoever. So we can talk about other things, and there's uh, plenty of things to talk about today. We got news. Not the least of which, obviously, is the departure of Stephanie McMahon from WWE. She is taking a leave of absence, and we'll give you some details on that. And what details we don't give you, well, I guess we can ask Dave Meltzer about it, because he will be on the show in the second segment of the program today, talking about all of the biggest news in the newest edition of the Wrestling Observer News. I guess probably means we will have to talk about Sasha and Naomi here today. But uh, also, in the final segment of the show, we'll be joined by Jay Bradley, one half of the Fixers tag team, along with Wrecking Ball Ligurski, who I believe may have once feuded with Bruno Sammartino. But anyway, we got a lot of fun stuff to get into today. So all the news, we got uh, the AW Dynamite ratings. The show did very well. We've got a uh, look at who the next likely challengers are for Roman Reigns. Because, you know, we ain't got none. But uh, the three challengers, spoiler here, are pretty much the three challengers that we've been talking about for weeks now as uh, potential challengers for Roman Reigns. Ric Flair's talked about criticism of his scheduled match at StarCast 5, where as he essentially said, it's not about the money. And I'm not sure anybody actually thought he was only doing it for the money. I think the, the criticism was more, you have a pacemaker and you want to wrestle at 73. But anyway, he talks about that. we got a lot of stuff to get into. Mike Semper VB joins us after the break. Lots of folks joining the program today. We'll kick it off after the break. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper VB, also WrestlingObserver.com. Thank God Stephanie McMahon is taking leave of absence so I don't have to open the show talking about Sasha and Naomi today. Oh, come on. In the new edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave Meltzer provided an update on Stephanie McMahon's leave of absence from WWE, which she announced yesterday, and which in fact caught most people in the company off guard. She announced Thursday she's taking a leave of absence from, quote, the majority of of her responsibilities with WWE. She wrote she looks forward to returning to the company after taking this time away to focus on her family. Meltzer reports the leave of absence was 100% Stephanie's choice and had been coming for some time, even though the announcement was a surprise to most. He wrote this came out of nowhere. Most talent and those in the office and creative didn't know about it until they heard that she tweeted it. There were definitely a few people who knew and knew the background, but they weren't saying much past there is more to it but the basic reason given uh, were not inaccurate. The part about leaving a focus on her family is definitely part of it. It was obviously a tough year with Paul Levesque being out for so long, and she had to pick up a lot of the responsibilities and obviously had to deal from a family standpoint with his health issues. Levesque is back in the office full-time now. So he's in the office full-time, but she's taking a leave of absence. There's no time frame for her turn. We are told she is returning. All kinds of speculation has transpired. You know what I need this week is more speculation. But the only thing we were told directly is that this was 100% her choice. This has been coming for some time. Not something that happened out of nowhere, even though it would appear, because virtually nobody knew anything, except a few who had kept it totally quiet until just before she released the info. But she was not forced or pressured. It was her choice as far as what it means for the future. That, at this point, would be all speculation. She was the public face of the company, had been pushed by the company to be positioned as one of the leading female sports executives in the country. Company president Nick Khan will be taking over her duties, and those who reported to her will now be reporting to him. Stephanie, besides being chief brand officer... I wonder if Brandy's available to take that job over for a while. Member of the company's board of directors, and aside from Vince, was the only original McMahon family member still working for the company. She owns 2.5% of the company, which would be valued at this point. Well, that was yesterday. Yesterday, it was $116 million. Who knows about today? 
In her role as chief brand officer, she's responsible for ensuring WWE's global brand strength and growth. Although, let's be honest, Stephanie McMahon was not responsible for ensuring the global strength and growth of WWE. Many, many people are responsible for that. But best wishes to her. Hopefully everything works out great and she uh, can return soon. That's the update on Stephanie McMahon. It's going to be a nutty day now. Sound like you got a beef with the sources, man. What are you talking about? They they, re- they report things. That's where the speculation comes in. And no, I'm talking about speculation it, from these fans. It runs rampant. I'm I'm turning into a <laughs> WWE heel. These oh fans are driving me out of my mind. Well, you know what? Maybe out of her mind right now. When you have three kids, you know, all only a couple of years apart, and she's had a long year. That's something that a lot of people, you know, they talked about Triple H being out and everything, and. Stephanie continuing on and how this affected NXT and all this stuff, but it's, you know, because we sometimes don't put it in, don't think about this, of this is a family with three young kids, 12, 14, and 16 years old, that it's tough, and this may be the best time to try to take a break, because I would assume Stephanie McMahon, even though she's got a lot of options outside WWE, is going to be back inside WWE until that company is sold, and... You know, until I mean, I don't know when you're when you're scheduled to take a break again in a, in a business that's relentless with a a focus like her father that is relentless. It is every day, every moment, you know, spent thinking about wrestling and trying to drive the business forward. When are you going to take another break again? So maybe with what happened with Triple H, it was a Stein to stop and go, hey, you know, appreciate what you got right now. Slow up. He's back to work. Let's ease off the uh, the pedal here a little bit. And take some time before we go back and and kick this thing back into gear again. And and you're obviously in safe hands, no matter what anybody wants to say about Nick Khan being the reaper of the McMahon family and forcing people out and all that other nonsense. I mean, my God, he's a great businessman. He's been fantastic for that company. They, they obviously work together great to get the TV deals through. They hire him from CAA or where William Morris, wherever exactly he was from. And he's been nothing but a success for them. So it's Vince McMahon's company. Nick Khan is doing great for them. If there's a time to step back, this is certainly a good time to do it. You're you know, right? I... I uh, <laughs> Are you okay? I made a big mistake yesterday. Oh, no. I broke my own rule. I I went and I read some of the comments on uh, <laughs> yesterday's Observer Live on, on YouTube. Uh-huh. What a stupid thing to do. How bad was it? Well, you know, normally, like, you know, I'll argue with people and everything like that, but it's rare that I really get irritated. But, man, somebody on there made some comment about you had mentioned, well, how come there's not the uh, fury over Tony Storm? Oh, that that uh, same energy, eh? And this guy goes, well, it's because she's white. And, dude, I was like, bro, on the list of differences in the two situations— the color of their skin is at the bottom, okay? Like, yes, Tony Storm decided she didn't want to do this anymore, and she went home, okay? You guys realize that, like, she was put in, We talked about the storyline, actually, where they wanted to rip her shirt off and everything like that, which they didn't do. They ended up doing the pie in the face or whatever. But, like, she endured that storyline. She was put in a feud with Charlotte Flair for the title, she lost a match, or she, I can't remember what the first match was, but they had one match, and it was a DQ ending. And then they built up to a championship match on TV where she was going to go in and she was going to do the job, okay? Now, if Tony Storm had showed up at the building, and then 15 minutes into the show, when she was told that she needed to do a job, she quit and walked out, well, you'd, you'd be close to what happened, with with Sasha and Naomi. But she didn't. She showed up in the building. She was told she had to do the job. She went into the ring. She did the match. She did the job. She literally finished out the entire storyline. It was done. And then afterwards, when the show was over, she went home. And 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 so the conclusion you've come to why why there is there is uh, you know 
a different reaction to what you know Sasha and Naomi did when they showed up at the building. We're given this, give it a one month storyline, and I don't want to get into this thing about how you know there were no plans after Hell in a Cell. Given it, there are no, there were no plans for them Monday, and they were given plans, but apparently having no plans after Hell in a Cell is worse. Than having no plans right now. But anyway, they showed up and they were, they were, actually, they weren't even told they were doing a job. Naomi was going to win. And they decided we're going to walk out at the beginning of the show and uh, just leave now. Somehow, some of you see this as the same thing. How? And then when it's obviously not the same thing, literally all you can come up with as to why the reaction is different is, well, Tony Storm is white. Wait, time Bro, out. Bro, get out of time here. Time out. Do you understand, though, why people of color, especially women, may have a distinct, uh, different opinion on some of this matter and may factor in other things uh, to, to have the reaction that they do? Can you see why some people, with the history of WWE, how people are treated even, again, even if Sasha has been obstreperous in the past, do you see why they may be looking at this, seeing Naomi doing this and and having a certain feeling or a cer- feeling a certain way? I, I, I find it difficult that you can't understand why there may be some cynicism over the reports that came this out. This is not some... cynicism. This is trolling somebody. Okay, I don't even know if he's trolling. He might actually be serious. You're you're battling. You're you're trying. (laughs) There is disingenuous people out there that will use anything. That is true. But there are, again, two things can be true. And how somebody looks at something. I mean, they there is a reason that some people are looking at this in the way that they are and looking at it with a side eye with it and not just jumping right in and seeing what WWE, how they responded when they've never responded like that before. They built it into their show on Monday when they didn't have to. They made the big deal out of this. So, again, they walked out at the beginning of the show. They walked out five minutes into the show. They quit in the middle of the show. Why did you bring this up? Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Simber, VV, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Dave, let's talk about Stephanie or something. What do you want to talk about? Well, what's up? She's uh, taking a leave of absence um, to spend more time with her family and other reasons, which I'm not exactly fully clear of, but that's the public reason. And uh, she'll be back sometime, and that's about it. She's not gone forever. But I don't. But there is no date for her return either. But Triple H is going to continue to work full-time in the office? Yes, he's still working full-time in the office, yes. All right. Well, I guess we'll see what happens here. But uh, yep. would, would you describe what she did as uh, more a figurehead role? I mean, how big a, how big an issue is this going to be her leaving and everyone had taken up her, her role? In, in, in what, I mean, she was the public face of the company in the sense that, like, if they had, you know, like... Uh, um, let's just say, like somebody, somebody wants a WWE person to, uh, you know, do a symposium or something. She would be the one that they would send. You know, she would do the buzzwords and everything like that. Um, you know, very, you know, public relations with the key people and everything. You know, keep in touch, schmooze. You know, things like that. I mean, creative wise, she had nothing to do with creative at all. You know, sometimes like, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, in the past she ran creative, but that's years and years ago. Sometimes when people go, oh, it's Stephanie McMahon, blah, 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 creative. And it's like, that was a very valid point 10 years ago, but she is, I mean, like, you know, she has like literally nothing to do with creative. So it's not in, in that sense, I don't think you'll be seeing any changes, but you know, as far as if you were, um, you know, one of the main sponsors or a media person, uh, or something like that. You know, it's a, it's probably the person in the company who may have been your uh, contact point. Yeah. All right. So obviously, uh, new issue of the Observer's up. If you want to read more about Stephanie, it is in the Observer WrestlingObserver dot com, and, uh, and and a ton about Sasha Banks and Naomi. We're trying to avoid that topic here today. <laughs> is there anything new this morning? If the no, answer is no, just say no, and we'll move on to the next there's topic. Absolutely not, there's nothing new this morning on it that, that isn't in the issue. I okay. mean, I guess if you if you haven't read the issue, there's a ton in the issue. But but since I wrote the issue, I don't I know nothing since since last night. Okay, so uh, Roman Reigns needs opponents, even though he's not around. 
Well, he does need opponents because he's going to be working three shows this summer. So yeah, he's going to be working three shows this summer. You know, maybe, 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 maybe a TV or a house show too, but three, three big shows. Yeah. All right. So uh, who do we got? The obvious uh, Riddle, Riddle Orton and Drew McIntyre are the leading candidates right now. Yeah. Uh, it's great, great idea to pin Riddle in that uh, six man. Well, I'm not sure we're not going to see him pinned again a couple times. Well, you're probably right about that. <laughs> so what is what is Roman's schedule for this summer? And is there any discussion about splitting these belts up so we actually have a champion again? Which I never thought I would say because I advocated putting the championships together. But I didn't um, expect the champion to then leave. Yeah, well, everyone expected, you know, I mean, like the whole thing was just they're eventually going to have two champions, but um, um, I don't know when, but uh, his schedule is July 2nd, you know, I mean, he's going to work TVs to build up these shows, but his three big matches are July 2nd, Vegas, July 30, Nashville, and September 3 in Cardiff, you know, the three stadium shows. Um, I don't think he's going to be doing any pay-per-views besides those. Um, he's not on Chicago. Um, and after that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he worked Survivor Series and then... Uh, you know, um, we'll see what happens. You know, obviously, you know, Royal Rumble and WrestleMania will be all over. We were uh, talking about the uh, XFL. And Saudi shows. He'll, he'll work the Saudi shows, I, I would, uh, you know, almost for sure. Yes. We were talking about the uh, XFL deal, uh, the, the new TV deal and the season kicking off and everything like that. And uh, I got to thinking, and I don't know what your thoughts are, but, uh, you know, Rock's got a very, very busy filming schedule. Yes, he does. But he's also got the uh, kickoff of the XFL, so to speak. Which is going to be very time-consuming. Yes. And so my my thought was, you know, is it possible that uh, he is going to do zero movie commitments for the first quarter of uh, 2023, which would allow him to do WrestleMania without having to worry about movie commitments and also have the time to help launch the first season of the XFL. So actually the timing for doing a WrestleMania match would be excellent this year because he has two different projects which would uh, require him to uh, uh, take time off from movies. Well, I'm, I'm sure at this point he doesn't know anyway. You know what I mean? It's like it's like ideas will come to him if, if and, you know, depending on what the projects are that he has to do. I mean, WrestleMania is not going to be number one on his priority list um, if he's got some big blockbuster movie thing coming up or a new TV show that he's got to film. He's got Young Rock, you know, things like that. I mean, um, thankfully, the travel isn't so bad. I mean, the travel situation is so bad. Like last year when, you know, he wanted to do a show, but uh, he was in Australia and he couldn't go back and forth. But, um, I mean, you know, it's always... You know, until January, it's, you know, if he's going to do WrestleMania against Roman Reigns or not, that's, you know, until January, it's just a hypothetical. You know, in January, he'll have a better idea. But now, you know, it's six months from really knowing if he'll be able to do it. I, I'm still skeptical he's going to do this match. But uh, if if he if he doesn't, what in the world do they have for WrestleMania next year? Well, I mean, a lot of times in July, they have no idea what they're going to be doing at WrestleMania next year. But Well, I mean, even um, if you have no idea, uh, well, what idea could you come up with for well, WrestleMania? Well, you've got to get somebody really you, hot. You've Braun crushed Breaker, everybody. Braun Breaker wins the Rumble. Braun Breaker, Gable Steveson, I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, you know. I mean, um, maybe there's another uh, celebrity that we haven't thought of, although I can't even come up with a name. Bad yeah. Bunny, the Pushes movie in his new, <laughs> his new action role. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This seems to be a well, Cody. A, a I mean, problem. honestly, I guess, Cody, yeah, Cody. Cody yeah, it's got to be Cody, Cody right? Yeah, yeah, Cody Rhodes. They're not rushing. If it's not They're... Braun, it's Cody. Um, I think it it's, much, if it's, not, if it's, it's much not, more if it, likely Cody than Braun. It I would should say. be. It should. Be. Um, yeah, yeah. I would say. I would say if it's not Rock, I would say Cody's the favorite. Yeah. Which means you have to protect Cody and make sure that he is <laughs> untouchable for the oh, most part. Oh, get out of here, Mike! Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I'm just saying protect it would be nice. Him. Well, if it was, if I it mean, was they me, should. But if it was me, I would. I would make him untouchable, but. Um, that's going to be very challenging for people who thrive on 50-50 booking to do that. I mean, he could lose. He could lose if it's done the right way a couple times. Or, you know, but I wouldn't want to do actually maybe once. <laughs> but uh, you know, don't. well, I mean, we've we're going to find out a lot in a couple of weeks because it'll be the third Seth Rollins Cody match, and yeah. Cody has won both of the other matches. Yes. So uh, in a 50-50 company, I mean, he's either losing or we're going to get a very rare. Guy wins all three matches against Top Star, which I think they should do. It's not going to hurt I, Seth. 
doesn't I mean, make any difference I, whatsoever for him. I I think that there's no argument for Seth winning this match. I don't think there's an argument. Well, there's no Seth logical winning. argument, but the argument would be, well, Cody beat him twice, but, so he's yeah, got to get a Yeah, but that's not that's not a valid argument. It's when, not when, a valid argument. When, I'm telling when, you what their argument would be because they're I mean, all about 50-50. Yeah, but the thing is the thing the thing is is that without a doubt Cody going for the championship is something that they're going to do. Okay, so until they get there, Seth Rollins shouldn't be beating him. I mean, afterwards, like let's say Cody gets his run, whatever, um, Seth can beat him then. But now, no, no. I mean, it, it it doesn't make. I can't. I cannot come up with a valid argument to beat Cody before he gets a championship match. Well, if it's just a matter of he gets beat by a better man because it's not a gimmick match, you don't give Seth an out that way, then what do you do with Seth? Then what's Seth, Seth's next step on that Looks, roster where he works with somebody else? Seth's been in that position. It's like Kevin Owens. Those guys, they're kind of recycled. They work with other people. You know, I mean, Seth's not wrestling Roman. Cody is. So Cody should win. Well, let me ask you this, since we're talking about the the, the lack of depth on the roster and they always go back to what they know, a guy that they can always go back to that people really believe in is Kevin Owens. Is there a way that even though we've seen things a zillion times with Kevin Owens and pretty much everybody except for Cody, is there a way to always bring Kevin Owens back like Lazarus in case you need him to be a world championship contender? For a pay-per-view, they could do it. Yeah, they could heat somebody up. Um, I, it would be tough. But, you know, I mean, the brand draws anyway. It doesn't even matter. The match is that much. If you call it WrestleMania, people are going to buy tickets. So, yes, Kevin's very um, talented. And, and they, you know, I wouldn't think he'd be high on the list. But I don't think if worse comes to worse, can you put him there? Of course you can, yeah. What the hell happened to this uh, women's audience for NXT this week? Um, Good God. What happened? What, what do you mean? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 you mean the rating being up or no? The women's viewership was like all time, all time record lows. Oh, I did not see that. I didn't even look that closely at the at the numbers. I just know that the um, NXT number itself was way up from the week before. Yeah, the NXT number was way up, but uh, I think it was uh, women eighteen to forty nine was a, a zero point zero five. Though they've done that before. They've done that before. Well, so all thing. the dudes heard it was an all-women show and decided to come back to the show, and all the women said, I heard it was an all-women show, and we hate Tiffany Stratton, and we're out of here. Is that what happened, Brian? I don't know. That's no, why I asked done, Dave. <laughs> they've done, they've done, um, they've done lower than that with women before. I mean, like, like normally, I mean, the 18 to 34 number that they usually do is like, you know, 0.07 anyway, and, and it's more guys than women. So that's, that's not that unusual, really. I mean, it's just, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not that un- unusual of a number. That is a very low female viewership for a program. Yeah. Well, listen, the new Observer, everybody, is available at WrestlingObserver.com right now if you want to head up and uh, check it out. Yes, if you want to read about Sasha and Naomi, that's the top story. And uh, Dave's got all of the details in there, so you can head up there and uh, check it out. Plus all the other news. There's 40,000 words of news and information in every Observer. And uh, you can grab a print copy, P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California, 95009. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elver is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sumber Vivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Very happy today to be joined by Jay Bradley. We talk some NWA here. It's, and really, hey, hey, you messed that up. It's the boss, Jay Bradley. The boss. I put that, I, oh, I dude. Put that hey, in listen. My name for a reason. We're we're trying so hard not to talk about the boss on this show here today. But I will allow you to be the boss. Just no talking about Sasha Banks. That's the other rule in the show. No swearing well, and no talking about Sasha Banks today. Oh, man. Okay. Yes. I'll slide in her DMs anyways. That's fine. All right. Listen. When I when I uh, you know I was I was looking at all this information and everything like that and you mentioned uh, <laughs> the Fixers tag team Wrecking Ball Ligurski. Years ago, I uh, was approached by somebody to uh, have a match with Larry Sweeney. This was about uh, 2007, and at the time, I didn't know who Larry Sweeney was. And I heard the name Larry Sweeney, and I thought, this guy's got to be like 55 years old. Like, you know, he had to start working like the 60s or 70s. Larry Sweeney? And it turned out he was younger than I was. But uh, Wrecking Ball Ligurski, are we sure that he didn't uh, feud with Bruno Sammartino? Uh, I think he'd probably be right up Bruno's alley back of the day. You know, a little ethnic origin to the name from the Northeast. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, if 
you know, Vince Sr. was around. He had his eyes on Wrecking Ball Ligurski to uh, face Bruno in the Garden and uh, both Boston. And uh, the, the big one for people that don't know, Madison Square Garden. You know, some people yes. don't know that kind of stuff. Yes. Well, Mr. Mr. Bradley, I, I don't know if boss. you if, if you're uh, if you're aware of this boss, but uh, the boss here on this show, Brian Alvarez, uh, he once barnstormed uh, around the Ohio Valley area, a place that you spent a significant period of time, and alongside people like Danny Davis and, and Rip Rogers, Shirley, and of course Al Snow, people Brian has has run across in the past what was that like for you certainly a unique group of men all three of those men are certainly they are throwbacks much like a wrecking ball Ligurski name is what was it like for you dealing out there with OVW and what did you learn uh I learned a lot at OVW uh I think it's it's probably one of the, the top end places to learn the business of pro wrestling in general um, I consider Danny Davis and Al mentors to this day. Uh, so you can blame them for all of my antics uh, and then, you know, pass up blame to Ligurski as well, because it's usually one of them that have made me do what I do. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very unique place, unique personalities, but it's very old school as far as its approach, um, as far as, you know, working uh a territory they still employ that as far as you know with the live event structure they they, they look to have and then how you place it off of television um on a weekly episodic television format so you, you get that experience on top of you know the standard wrestling training that you're going to get at just about any academy or school out there so um you know, and I've always dug the Louisville area. It kind of reminds me uh, of some places of, of Chicago on a much smaller scale. So i um, always felt at home there. So I do try to venture down there here and there. Uh, I haven't lately, um, but I was there prior to COVID and on and off with some other antics that I had going on in my career and um, always enjoyed my time there. You know, you've uh, you've been around for a long time. and uh, you just call, Did you just call me old, Alvarez? I didn't say you were old. I said you'd been around for a long time. Oh, well, okay. All Obviously. Right. I, I, got, I was a young vet, a young well, veteran. Well, of we'll course. You're a, you're a grizzled young veteran. But, uh, yes, I'll use that. Yes, you, when I look at this, you know, deep south, Ohio Valley, and, uh, you know, Florida Championship Wrestling, and, and now NWA and WWE and everything like that, I mean, you, you missed a couple spots. I there did. Was like, there was Wrestle One. Wrestle, was- yes. Pro he doesn't know Noah, about you and Madman Pondo impact. hooking up. Man, you, didn't do your, you didn't do your homework, man. I did Alvarez. well. Come on. Listen, I, if I rattle off all the places you've been, the segment would end. But my point no, is, true. as a man who uh, who has been to these various places during his career, this business has changed so much. And I want to get your, your thoughts on that. Because when Mike mentioned, like, the old school OVW and... Danny Davis and Rip Rogers and you know I'm I'm looking at these names. I watch this show every single week. They would send me the the DVDs of the OVW TV show and I watch that every single week. Jamin Olavensi is the champion. I mean, yep. but when you look back at it, I mean, that was a different business in a lot of ways than it is today. So, what what are your thoughts on on all of the changes that you've seen during your career? Uh Wow, yeah, that's a you know that's a deep question, there, Alvarez. You, you you wrote that one down earlier in the week, didn't you? No, it's you, one of my go-to's. No, oh, okay. Well, and it's a good go-to. You put that in your pocket for later. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I you can't help if you've been in there. I know you've been around the business for a while too, Brian. You know, as a fan, and then you know doing your stick here, reporting on it, and interacting and publicizing. Um, you know. I, I got in this business over 20 years ago and, you know, even if you put a start point where I signed with WWE and I was in the deep South, like the, you know, what, what happens in that ring, you know, uh, has been the same in a way since the beginning of, of time, you know, it's competitors and we're putting in an athletic competition to, 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 to an end that's supposed to mean something that's supposed to, you know, push a story forward or, uh, you know, 
elevate a talent or, you know, whatever you want to spin it as, but ultimately it all comes down to selling tickets and putting eyes on, on, on your product and your match. But, you know, like I said, go back to that start point of deep South, like, you know, uh, social media wasn't a thing. YouTube, I think broke right around that time. And that was like taboo, you know, Twitter and, you know, I think Facebook and MySpace were just in its infancy phases too. Um, so it's like, deep south searching for a television outlet when i was there but we were still filming tv to air at a later date to now it's just you know anybody you know essentially can have some sort of television product on youtube or a streaming service um depending on what quality you're going to get or the production values but the opportunity is there and the exposure is there for you know new companies and existing companies, talent and otherwise with, with social media. Um, so I would say like all the, all the stuff around the business has altered and changed dramatically, but what it does inside the ring or inside the arena is still damn near the same. Um, you know, with that, it's like, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you keep people's attentions? How do you keep people watching? You know what I mean? Is it your character? Is it, you know, me and Ligurski goofing off and, and, and hosting a, a episode of, you know, Power or USA and introducing matches or, or is it, you know, 30 second reels and clips on social media now. So, you know, the way fans interact and what they expect from a performer is different, too. You know, they want to have a lot of access to you via those social medias and upfront interactions and whatnot. So, um but it's for a lot of things, though, too, I think, you know, even like, you know, if you're in a, you know, pop culture, whether it's music or comics and movies and all of that change, it's a whole other layer uh, of business to, to consider. Well, no matter what, experience is the, the best thing that you can have in your arsenal. And you have a massive amount of it with a, a unique number of people, whether it be teaming with Madman Pondos or being in OVW or so many things up until what you're doing now in the NWA and elsewhere. But I do have to ask you, because it's like a fever dream now to me, these old Enoki genome shows. And am I crazy or did you and Bobby Lashley make a visit? over to japan for a enoki genome show am i hallucinating that or, or did no, that really no, occur because it you, feels like you, it's forever ago now yeah oh yeah it, it it was probably about it is about 10 years ago i think it was about 2012 or 13 somewhere in there and yeah it, talk about a misfit band of guy gene it was me bobby lashley vladimir kozloff oh my and, god uh and viscera I'm sorry, oh. my, my my puppy is over here going nuts like Ligurski when there's no food at Cato. He heard right that now. lineup. You'll get, you'll get <laughs> food, yeah, but yeah. And then you had uh, some other pro kickboxers like Peter Arts or Ertz. I believe he's a, he's a Dutchman. Uh, just, the lumberjack. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And a very hodgepodge show, but it, it, decent – Decent audience there, almost a sellout. My first trip to Japan, and very interesting for me and educational. So yeah, you, you got on. It, it is a little bit of a of a hallucination there, like a bad meth trip of pro wrestling and MMA, but it happened. Well, how are you tapped for something like that? Because it seems to be it's a lot easier to make connections now to at least make a connection to get over to Japan. I mean, how were you even brought up for something like this? Uh, so a, a blip on the radar in, in, in my career was I had a brief stint at the original Enoki Dojo in Los Angeles, um, like Santa Monica area, Los Angeles. I don't know what they termed it as when Enoki owned New Japan. Um, I was there for a few months training and things just weren't going well for me personally and wasn't working out for me professionally, but I had made some connections obviously with the Enoki family and, and other people. Um, that's how I first came across Dave Marquez uh, from out that way from Championship Wrestling, from Hollywood and his UWN network. Um, but that's how the connection was made. And um, there's, you know, there's good business and you stay connected with people and networking. And that just became easier with social media where, you know, you click on a button and there's your old buddy or an old 
rival or old promoter, booker, trainer, or whatever, and you guys can stay connected on, uh, you know, the interwebs or whatever. I mean, even Legursi can do that. I mean, we watch us at point and quick. He's better at the internet than I am. He learns stuff like, teaches me stuff like that all the time. But yeah, so that's kind of how it was. Uh, you know, I still had some contact with uh, the Inoki family, particularly Simon and, uh, you know, he had come across my social media and made a deal. That is the uh, worst breaking of kayfabe that I've ever heard. That wrecking ball Ligurski is good on the internet. Well, look at look at I tell I tell other people about Ligurski. Here's the thing: he's not dumb. He just has a very he has a very smart single track mind. So like you get him going on one track, he's an idiot savant. I but see. if you do it, you derail that train. It, it's it's like a nuclear meltdown. Sure, it's like a train wreck. He tweets with train a hammer wreck. and a chisel. With yes, a, with a with a wrecking ball with a train. Oh, wreck. imagine worst. that! Hey, June eleventh, always ready on pay per view, the NWA, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how much has been announced yet, but uh, what can you tell us about uh, about your participation at the show? Well, there's there's been I think they just announced my. Uh, my beat down on rock and roll this past week. So it'd be myself and wrecking ball Ligurski versus, uh, the old Kentucky waterfall icon himself, Ricky Morton and his, uh, entitled son, Carrie. Uh, I don't know if you saw that recently with, uh, wrecking ball beating up on old, uh, old punky, uh, a couple weeks ago or last Horrible. week on on U, uh, NWA USA on Saturdays. Um, and then there's a third variable that's going to be interesting with, uh, I think it's George Costanza's son, AJ Costanza, uh, and a mystery partner. So I don't know who this mystery partner is. I don't know why he's in the match. I, I'm not even going to ask Wrecking Ball on that because it might make him blow a, blow, blow a gasket. His, his wheels start spinning, and like I said, it'll, the hamster will fall off the wheel, and we're done. Don't, don't. Uh, but, well, listen, hold that we, thought. we got to head to a commercial break here. It is radio. We'll be back in a moment to finish the plugs. Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sabravivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. The Boss! Joining us that's here right. today. The Boss! Jay Bradley. Put some respect on that. That's right. June 11th, always ready on pay-per-view. The NWA, the National Wrestling Alliance. You and the Wrecking Ball. Going to be tearing it up on that show, dropping that ball on everyone's heads. So let's get some plugs in here. Wait, did you just just say you're going to... Do you just want me to teabag someone on paper? No, ball not I said? dropping the wrecking ball on their heads. Okay, all right. Yes, all right. We'll, we'll go with that. Holy smokes! Hey, tell us about the show. Your own social media, whatever's on your mind. So we got a big three-way tag match, like I was saying before. These these ads rudely interrupted. Yes. what I was about to say. So you got this guy AJ Costanza with the mystery partner in one corner, and one corner. You got me and Ligurski. In another corner, you got nobody because it's only three-way, not four. And in the fourth, you got punky rock and roll Ricky Morton and that entitled millennial brat kid of his, Carrie Morton. And it's going to be a three-way. We got a lot of variables. Like I said, there's a it's three. If you don't, you know, right after two, there's three instead of two, and then there's a mystery man. And now there's rumored to be the winner is going to get a shot at the NWA tag team titles, oh. which are also on the line in Knoxville that same night with La Rebellion versus Doug Williams and Harry Smith, or also known to some as Davy Boy Smith Jr. Yes. So that's going to be a lot of tag team shuffling going on that match or that night. Uh, I don't know about you, Alvarez, but I think I got the inside track wink wink nudge nudge you might want to put some money on me and wrecking ball because you know what we're fixers we yeah, take care fixers. of business and we fix any problem and i see a lot of problems when i do look at that run sheet well we got a problem here and that's we're out of time but i want to thank you so much for doing the show today everybody for listening we'll talk to you next time wrestling observer live